Chapter 6 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 6 by the laws of the united states i am still a slave and though i am now growing old i might even yet be deemed of sufficient value to be worth pursuing as far as my present residence if those to whom the law gives the right of dominion over my person and life knew where to find me for these reasons i have been advised by those whom i believe to be my friends not to disclose the true names of any of those families in which i was a slave in carolina or georgia lest this narrative should meet their eyes and in some way lead them to a discovery of my retreat i was now the slave of one of the most wealthy planters in carolina who planted cotton rice indigo corn and potatoes and was the master of two hundred and sixty slaves the description of one great cotton plantation will give a correct idea of all others, and I shall here present an outline of that of my master's. He lived about two miles from the Coggery River, which bordered his estate on one side, and in the swamps of which were his rice fields. The country hereabout is very flat, the banks of the river are low, and in wet seasons large tracts of country are flooded by the superabundant water of the river. There are no springs, and the only means of procuring water on the plantations is from wells, which must be sunk in general about twenty feet deep, before a constant supply of water can be obtained. My master had two of these wells on his plantation, one at the mansion house and one at the quarter. My master's house was of brick, Brick houses are by no means common among the planters, whose residences are generally built of framework, weather-boarded with pine boards, and covered with shingles of the white cedar or juniper cypress, and contained two large parlors, and a spacious hall or entry on the ground floor. The main building was two stories high, and attached to this was a smaller building, one story and a half high, with a large room where the family generally took breakfast, with a kitchen at the farther extremity from the main building. There was a spacious garden behind the house, containing, I believe, about five acres, well cultivated and handsomely laid out. In this garden grew a great variety of vegetables, some of which I have never seen in the market of Philadelphia. It contained a profusion of flowers, three different shrubberies, a vast number of ornamental and small fruit trees, and several small hothouses with glass roofs. There was a head gardener who did nothing but attend to this garden through the year, and during the summer he generally had two men and two boys to assist him. In the months of April and May this garden was one of the sweetest and most pleasant places that I ever was in. At one end of the main building was a small house called the library, in which my master kept his books and papers, and where he spent much of his time. At some distance from the mansion was a pigeon house, and near the kitchen was a large wooden building called the kitchen quarter, in which the house servants slept, and where they generally took their meals. Here also the washing of the family was done, and all the rough or unpleasant work of the kitchen department, such as the cleaning and salting fish, putting up pork, etc., was assigned to this place. There was no barn on this plantation, according to the acceptation of the word barn in Pennsylvania, but there was a wooden building, about forty feet long, called the coach house, in one end of which the family carriage and the chaise in which my master rode were kept. Under the same roof was a stable, large enough to contain a dozen horses, in one end the corn intended for the horses was kept, and the whole of one loft was occupied by the blades and tops of the corn. About a quarter of a mile from the dwelling-house were the huts or cabins of the plantation slaves, standing in rows. There were thirty-eight of them, 
generally about sixteen feet square, and provided with pine floors. In these cabins were two hundred and fifty people, of all ages, sexes, and sizes. A short distance from the cabins was the house of the overseer. In one corner of his garden stood a corn crib and a provision house. A little way off stood the house containing the cotton gin. There was no smokehouse, nor any place for curing meat, and while I was on this plantation no food was ever salted for the use of the slaves. I went out into the garden, and after sundown my old master sent me to the overseer's house. He was just coming in from the field, followed by a great number of black people. He asked me my name, and, calling a middle-aged man who was passing us at some distance, told him he must take me to live with him. I followed my new friend to his cabin, which was the shelter of his wife and five children. The only furniture consisted of a few blocks of wood for seats, a short bench made of a pine board which served as a table, and a small bed in one corner, composed of a mat made of common rushes, spread upon some corn husks, pulled and split into fine pieces, and kept together by a narrow slip of wood, confined to the floor by wooden pins. There was a common iron pot standing beside the chimney, and several wooden spoons and dishes hung against the wall. Several blankets also hung against the wall, upon wooden pins. An old box, made of pine boards, without either lock or hinges, occupied one corner. At the time I entered this humble abode, the mistress was not at home, she had not yet returned from the field, having been sent, as the husband informed me, with some other people, late in the evening, to do some work in a field about two miles distant. I found a child about a year old, lying on the mat bed, and a little girl about four years old sitting beside it. These children were entirely naked, and when we came to the door, the elder rose from its place and ran to its father, and clasping him round one of his knees, said, Now we shall get good supper. The father laid his hand upon the head of his naked child, and stood silently looking in its face, which was turned upward toward his own for a moment, and then, turning to me, said, Did you leave any children at home? The scene before me, the question propounded, and the manner of this poor man and his child, caused my heart to swell until my breast seemed too small to contain it. My soul fled back upon the wings of fancy, to my wife's lowly dwelling in Maryland, where I had been so often met on a Saturday evening, when I paid them my weekly visit, by my own little ones, who clung to my knees for protection and support, even as the poor little wretch now before me seized upon the weary limb of its hapless and destitute father, hoping that, naked as he was, for he too was naked save only the tattered remains of a pair of old trousers, he would bring with his return at evening its customary scanty supper. I was unable to reply, but stood motionless, leaning against the walls of the cabin. My children seemed to flit by the door in the dusky twilight, and the twittering of a swallow, which at that moment fluttered over my head, sounded in my ear as the infantile tittering of my own little boy. But on a moment's reflection I knew that we were separated, without a hope of ever again meeting, that they no more heard the welcome tread of my feet, and could never again receive the little gifts, with which, poor as I was, I was accustomed to present them. I was far from the place of my nativity, in a land of strangers, with no one to care for me beyond the care that a master bestows upon his ox, with all my future life one long, waste, barren desert of cheerless, hopeless, lifeless slavery, to be varied only by the pangs of hunger and the stings of the lash. My reverie was at length broken by the appearance of the mother of the family, with her three eldest children. The mother wore an old ragged shift, but the children— the eldest of whom appeared to be about twelve, and the youngest six years old, were quite naked. When she came in, the husband told her that the overseer had sent me to live with them, and she and her oldest child, who was a boy, immediately set about preparing their supper, 
by boiling some of the leaves of the weed called lamb's quarter in the pot. This, together with some cakes of cold cornbread, formed their supper. My supper was brought to me from the house of the overseer by a small girl, his daughter. It was about half a pound of bread, cut from a loaf made of cornmeal. My companions gave me a part of their boiled greens, and we all sat down together to my first meal in my new habitation. I had no bed other than the blanket which I had brought with me from Maryland, and I went to sleep in the loft of the cabin, which was assigned to me as my sleeping room, and in which I continued to lodge as long as I remained on this plantation. The next morning I was waked at the break of day by the sound of a horn which was blown very loudly. Perceiving that it was growing light, I came down and went out immediately in front of the house of the overseer, who was standing near his own gate blowing the horn. In a few minutes the whole of the working people from all the cabins were assembled, and as it was now light enough for me distinctly to see such objects as were about me, I at once perceived the nature of the servitude to which I was in future to be subject. As I have before stated, there were altogether on this plantation two hundred and sixty slaves, but the number was seldom stationary for a single week. Births were numerous and frequent, and deaths were not uncommon. When I joined them, I believe we counted in all two hundred and sixty-three, but of these only one hundred and seventy went to the field to work. The others were children too small to be of any service as laborers, old and blind persons, or incurably diseased. Ten or twelve were kept about the mansion-house and garden, chosen from the most handsome and sprightly of the gang. I think about one hundred and sixty-eight assembled that morning at the sound of the horn, two or three being sick, sent word to the overseer that they could not come. The overseer wrote something on a piece of paper and gave it to his little son. This, I was told, was a note to be sent to our master, to inform him that some of the hands were sick, it not being any part of the duty of the overseer to attend to a sick negro. The overseer then led off to the field, with his horn in one hand and his whip in the other, we following, men, women, and children, promiscuously, and a wretched-looking troop we were. There was not an entire garment amongst us. More than half of the gang were entirely naked. Several young girls, who had arrived at puberty, wearing only the livery with which nature had ornamented them, and a great number of lads, of an equal or superior age, appeared in the same costume, there was neither bonnet, cap, nor headdress of any kind amongst us, except the old straw hat that I wore, and which my wife had made for me in Maryland. This I soon laid aside, to avoid the appearance of singularity. And, as owing to the severe treatment I had endured, whilst travelling in chains, and being compelled to sleep on the naked floor without undressing myself, my clothes were quite worn out. I did not make a much better figure than my companions, though still I preserved the semblance of clothing so far that it could be seen that my shirt and trousers had once been distinct and separate garments. Not one of the others had on even the remains of two pieces of apparel. Some of the men had old shirts, and some ragged trousers, but no one wore both. Amongst the women, several wore petticoats, and many had shifts, not one of the whole number wore both of these vestments. We walked nearly a mile through one vast cotton field before we arrived at the place of our intended day's labor. At last the overseer stopped at the side of the field, and calling to several of the men by name, ordered them to call their companies and turn into their rows. The work we had to do today was to hoe and weed cotton for the last time, and the men whose names had been called, and who were, I believe, eleven in number, were designated as captains, each of whom had under his command a certain number of the other hands. The captain was the foreman of his company, and those under his command had to keep up with him. Each of the men and women had to take one row, and two, and in some cases where they were very small, three of the children had one.' 
The first captain, whose name was Simon, took the first row, and the other captains were compelled to keep up with him. By this means the overseer had nothing to do but to keep Simon hard at work, and he was certain that all the others must work equally hard. Simon was a stout, strong man, apparently about thirty-five years of age, and for some reason unknown to me I was ordered to take a row next to his. The overseer, with his whip in his hand, walked about the field after us to see that our work was well done. As we worked with hoes, I had no difficulty in learning how the work was to be performed. The fields of cotton at this season of the year are very beautiful. The plants among which we worked this day were about three feet high, and in full bloom, with branches so numerous that they nearly covered the whole ground, leaving scarcely space enough between them to permit us to move about and work with our hoes. About seven o'clock in the morning the overseer sounded his horn, and we all repaired to the shade of some persimmon trees, which grew in a corner of the field, to get our breakfast. I here saw a cart drawn by a yoke of oxen, driven by an old black man nearly blind. The cart contained three barrels filled with water, and several large baskets full of cornbread that had been baked in the ashes. The water was for us to drink, and the bread was our breakfast. The little son of the overseer was also in the cart, and had brought with him the breakfast of his father in a small wooden bucket. The overseer had bread, butter, cold ham, and coffee for his breakfast. Ours was composed of a corn cake, weighing about three quarters of a pound, to each person, with as much water as was desired. I at first supposed that this bread was dealt out to the people as their allowance, but on further inquiry I found this not to be the case. Simon, by whose side I was now at work, and who seemed much pleased with my agility and diligence in my duty, told me that here, as well as everywhere in this country, each person received a peck of corn at the crib door every Sunday evening, and that in ordinary times every one had to grind this corn and bake it for him or herself, making such use of it as the owner thought proper, but that for some time past the overseer, for the purpose of saving the time which had been lost in baking the bread, had made it the duty of an old woman who was not capable of doing much work in the field, to stay at the quarter and bake the bread of the whole gang. When baked it was brought to the field in a cart, as I saw, and dealt out in loaves. They still had to grind their own corn after night, and as there were only three hand-mills on the plantation, he said they experienced much difficulty in converting their corn into meal. We worked in this field all day, and at the end of every hour, or hour and a quarter, we had permission to go to the cart, which was moved about the field so as to be near us, and get water. Our dinner was the same in all respects as our breakfast, except that in addition to the bread we had a little salt and a radish for each person. We were not allowed to rest at either breakfast or dinner longer than while we were eating, and we worked in the evening as long as we could distinguish the weeds from the cotton plants. Simon informed me that formerly, when they baked their own bread, they had left their work soon after sundown to go home and bake for the next day, but the overseer had adopted the new policy for the purpose of keeping them at work until dark. When we could no longer see to work, the horn was again sounded, and we returned home. I had now lived through one of the days, a succession of which make up the life of a slave, on a cotton plantation. As we went out in the morning, I observed several women, who carried their young children in their arms to the field. These mothers laid their children at the side of the fence, or under the shade of the cotton plants, whilst they were at work, and when the rest of us went to get water, they would go to give suck to their children, requesting someone to bring them water in gourds, which they were careful to carry to the field with them. One young woman did not, like the others, leave her child at the end of the row, but had contrived a sort of rude knapsack made of a piece of coarse linen cloth, in which she fastened her child, which was very young, upon her back and in this way carried it all day, 
and performed her task at the hoe with the other people. I pitied her, and as we were going home at night, escorted her and learned her history. She had been brought up a lady's maid, and knew little of hardship, until she was sold south by a dissipated master. On this plantation she was obliged to marry a man she did not like, and was often severely whipped, because she could not do as much work as the rest. I was affected by her story, and the overseer's horn interrupted our conversation, at hearing which she exclaimed, "'We're too late. Let us run, or we shall be whipped.' and setting off as fast as she could run, she left me alone. I quickened my pace, and arrived in the crowd a moment before her. End of chapter 6